Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 115, Bugging the Avengers Campus. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my brilliant and beautiful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Aww. How are you today, dear? I am good. How are you? I am so good. I am actually going to pretend like I'm not fixing my soundboard right now and continue talking like I'm a professional. Wow. That is talent. That's how good I am. <laughs> <laughs> so how was your week this week? Uh, it was good. How was your Father's Day? My Father's Day was fantastic. It was a whole weekend celebration of Father's Day. Mm-hmm. Makes me wish I was that good of a father. No, it nice. was nice. It was nice. We all got together. Sam came over. It was it was the first Father's Day in a couple of years that that all the kids were around, and, mm-hmm. and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. We went to Dave and Buster's. We had some fun there. Yeah, it was kind of <clears throat> unique because we've done Dave and Buster's before the four of us, right? But we don't always play games together. Usually, you know, Maddie and I go off and do something. You and Sam might go off and do something, or you go off and Sam goes off. But we for the most part, actually did a lot of we games had a together. We wicked so. game of Hungry Hungry Hippos. <laughs> we did. Good thing we didn't get any video of that. That was an incredibly violent game. <laughs> that was a violent game. You know, they are the deadliest <clears throat> creatures in the jungle, so. And now I know why. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we did that. We did some uh, air hockey, some uh, axe throwing. Yeah, yeah. Some racing, although we were all individually racing and didn't realize <laughs> we it. We didn't realize We were finished. <laughs> right, right. Um, what else? Did, oh, we did Pong. That, we did Pong that, that didn't work out very didn't well. didn't work out. Yeah. But it was nice that they had a number of games where you could have, you know, four people playing right, all right. together. So that was Well, and the one nice. thing that we kind of missed was the four-player air hockey that they have Right, in right, right. <clears throat> so, oh, we did the squirt gun, the water gun thing, which too. Which I was so confused about. Because <laughs> that no one was, that it was basically you had to plot against everybody else. Right. It wasn't about getting to yours first. It was, it was getting everybody else, getting out, everybody before else out before yeah. you. Yeah, so. You all conspired against me, though, so that's okay. Yeah, we did. That's oh, great. It was Father's that's Day. Great. But that's not what we're talking about today. Today in our Disney Detective, we'll talk about which COVID changes are here to stay at Disney. They finally announced that. And we'll talk about a bug's land that may be gone but not forgotten at Avengers Campus. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Nothing with Gina Carano. Yes, I know. I noticed that. Although I was going to crack up my Father's Day pack and do an interview with Gina Carano. but <laughs> Maybe we'll do that next weekend. Next week, maybe. Next week. We might have a special guest. <laughs> Cara Dune, sorry, Cara Dune, not right, Tina right. <laughs> Though, So this week in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, an X-Wing is <clears throat> landing at the Smithsonian, and which Star Wars character could replace Jack Sparrow? And then in our entertainment news, the boys issues an appropriately harsh warning to those begging for season three, and Harrison Ford once again is injured while filming a movie, this time Indiana Jones 5. Poor guy. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, he's, what, 78 now? Yeah. <clears throat> that's uh, a... Stunt double. Yeah, Just really. Saying. Just showing up, he needs a stunt double now. <laughs> uh, and then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Uh, I'm back to my old hats with uh, what I have this week. Mm-hmm. And then we'll finish up with a quick few afterthoughts. We have mm-hmm. another afterthought this week that we didn't have list this week that recently was announced. So right, right. Good news there. Mm-hmm. Before we get into that, though, I would invite all of our listeners and viewers to subscribe to the podcast. You can get the audio version of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment, or you can get the video version of this in all the network's podcasts listed as Insights into Things, 
We're available on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, Pandora, et cetera, et cetera. I would also invite everyone to give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We are on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things, or you can get links to all of those and more on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Shall we get into it? Sure. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So uh, the first story comes from the LATimes.com, and it was basically talking about which COVID error changes will be staying and which ones will be going. Because obviously uh, Disneyland now has opened up, and California has lifted most of its coronavirus safety reg, uh, reg- restrictions this week. So now they're kind of continuing to open certain things of the park that haven't been opened yet. Um, so obviously there's still a few things that are, are kind of going to stick. Uh, the chairman of Disney Parks has said, had said, I don't want to say that we're going back uh, to the way it was, but we have to be smart in the way that we do this. So, um, you know, the attendance gaps and the physical distance requ- uh, requirements are pretty much gone. Um, so now they can s- kind of open up some more of the rides that they hadn't opened yet. Uh, also some musical acts and the nighttime shows over the next few weeks and other attractions later this summer. So... Uh, Disney executives said that the 15-month closure kind of helped them rethink how to best manage one of the biz- bi- blah, 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 biggest headaches at the resort, and that would be the you know the crowds. Um, so in trying to so one of the things that they talked about keeping in place was the reservation system that they adopted to kind of manage how many visitors came to the park each day. Um, so again, not much information about how long that's going to be or, or what the cap is or anything, but basically you can't just decide to go to the, well, you might be able to decide to, you know, go to a park on a certain day, but you actually have to go on their app and make a reservation for that day. Uh, the other thing that they had gotten rid of was the annual pass program, Now, they did make some sort of announcements, but not really a whole lot of information as to the replacement membership program that's supposed to be released relatively soon. So before the end of the year, probably even before the end of the summer, they'll uh, discuss what that whole thing is. Um, So, you know, obviously... Things that have gone away is no longer do you have to have your temperature checked, Um, even though if you're fully vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. They're not asking for proof. So it's basically on the honor system for mask wearing. Um, The other thing, too, that they are starting to use a little bit more is the virtual queue system when they opened up. Uh, Avengers Campus, the Spider-Man ride, has the virtual queue as well. Um, So originally when the park first opened, they had a virtual queue system to just be able to get into the Avengers Campus to try and limit the amount of people that were in there that they've now stopped using, but they do do still use it for the one ride. Um, Some of the other things that are set to open... Uh, later on or come back would be the Disneyland band. Some of the other musical acts are supposed to be coming back this summer. Um, Buzz Lightyear, Astro Blaster, and Storybook Land Canal boats are supposed to reopen next week. The fireworks are coming back in July. We were talking about that uh, last week. Um, Parades and opportunities to meet costume characters are supposed to come back at some point. The one thing that they did say was that the monorail and the Finding Nemo submarine voyage ride are still remaining closed with no date yet as to when they will uh, be opening. Um, So, you know, although they do have a lot of attractions that aren't available, the other 
part of that is that the wait times are increasing because there aren't as many attractions. So the Indiana Jones ride um, and Rise of the Resistance and Space Mountain, you know, as of Thursday, which isn't a peak day, already had 40 minute wait times uh, at one point. So they're obviously trying to kind of work through everything and it's kind of in phased uh, uh, openings, I guess, you know, for, for different things and kind of see, um, you know, where, where it goes and what they continue to add maybe to the virtual queue. Cause that's something we've talked about a couple of times, them hinting to add more rides to the virtual queue to help keep those wait times down. So <clears throat> the reservation system that mm-hmm. they have in place right now, do they publish how many reservations they allow people to have in the in the park during the day? How many Mm-mm. how many people they're allowing in? No, no, right. there's nothing. So so the reservation system is basically bogus. Probably you can also get park hoppers now. Park hopper passes are available, right? And park hoppers don't require you to reserve multiple park reservations. Right. So you can hop from park to park to park. Well, and I don't know how it works in California because in, in, in Florida it's a little different because in Florida you have to make a reservation for one park and you can't park hop until 2 o'clock or something. Right. You, you can't, you know, just all of a sudden go from one park to another. I don't know how it is with, with California, so I don't know if they have park hopper availability in California yet. So they did a way – or they're, they're – Doing away or have done away with uh, the fast pass system because it was complicated and you had to plan it out ahead of time if you were to take advantage of it. Right. And then what they do to combat the overcrowding that they did nothing to combat was they implement a reservation system Mm -hmm. that's basically a fast pass for the entire park just to get into the park. Basically. Which you now, and and they talk about the fact that you have to, you know, they're booked two weeks out at a time. Mm -hmm. So... You potentially could book a vacation, get a get your park tickets, and they won't even let you buy park tickets until you can book a, a reservation in the park now. Right. So I'm not sure how this is solving any problems. Mm. If they have the reservation system in place and your wait times are still unacceptably right. high. So how is that solving anything? Because I can almost guarantee you they're allowing more people in the park than they can support, which is why the wait times are so high. Probably. Mm-hmm. So the so the 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 reservation system doesn't do you any good if you're still going to allow too many people in, mm-hmm. and they're not going to stop people from coming into the park when they can get money for it. Absolutely. So that's window dressing. So mm-hmm. if they're going to solve the problem with overcrowding and long lines, your virtual queue really is the only thing that you have going for you at this point mm-hmm. in time. So Disney, once again, not quite doing it right. But uh, I think the moral of the story here is that things aren't going back to the way that we thought they were going back. And it's not because of safety reasons. It's because of monetization reasons. Disney realized they can make more money by doing these other things than by allowing you to come back in the way things were. So even, even less interested in going to Disney at this point in time. But, hey, that's not the only Disney story we have. (laughs) Thank God. We're not going to just bust on Disney today. That was last week's episode. Right. (laughs) What's the next one we have? So uh, from InsideTheMagic.net, we have a story that talks about how uh, Disney left one big tribute to a Bugs Land at Avengers Uh, Avengers Campus. So on June 4th, the highly anticipated opening of Avengers Campus happened at the Disneyland Resort, Disney California Adventure Park. So Marvel fans had been waiting for this day for quite some time and still can't believe that they're now able to visit uh, Disney's first Marvel-themed land. Uh, If you haven't seen any of the videos or pictures of it, um, you you know, it it is really, really amazing to to see. And I'm sure it's one of those things when you see it in person, it's even more so. So obviously from Captain Marvel to Spider-Man to Iron Man, Captain America, Black Widow, you know, the Avengers campus guests, you know, you never know who's going to pop up in this immersive uh, Disney Park area. 
But to make space for this to be built, another land had to say goodbye. So in 2018, Disneyland Resort announced that it had to get rid of a Bugs Land section of the park, um, which was also part of the It's Tough to Be a Bug stage that had actually opened when the park um, had had first opened in 2001 to make way for this takeover. Um, but what was nice was that Walt Disney Imagineering didn't forget about a Bugs Land, however. They made sure to include some fun Easter eggs in the new uh, PIM testing lab uh, that is designed to showcase drinks created by uh, Dr. Pym and presumably his daughter Hope and her boyfriend Scott. And so in the area, the iconic Christmas lights that were used in the Bugsland area are proudly hanging at this testing lab. Um, so if you, you know, happen to be there and you see these big giant Christmas lights, those were actually from the Bugs Land. Uh, and they look kind of cool, um, you know, at night. So the D23 uh, website had officially described Bugs Land as an area featuring Flick's Fun Fair, attractions for children. Um, and it, it was really like the kitty park. Uh, Maddie and I had gone to it the one time uh, when we were out in California. It was really, you know, meant for like the little kids, you know, they weren't like big giant rides, but it was cute because it kind of had that Toy Story um, land feel where, you know, you're the size of a bug Everything type thing. Oversized. Everything was oversized. Like the benches looked like they were used popsicle sticks that actually had like the stain from uh -huh. the color of the popsicle. So, you know, it was a very cute theming the way uh, that they did it. So it was nice that they were able to use some of that and, and add that. Um, you know, so it, it's always one of those things that, um, you know, Disney doesn't always get rid of things. They always like to reuse and repurpose. So it's nice that they were able to pay homage. Well, they're, uh, they're pretty tight on real estate out in California. Oh, yeah. Too, they can't so really. They, they can't expand out like you can in Florida. Right. And that's that's the other thing, too, is, you know, you know, in, in Florida, they have so much land that they yeah. can just kind of, you know, extend out or go up or whatever. Where California, they're kind of boxed in. Right. So well, it's nice that they kept that hang mm -hmm. that that. that uh, aspect of the attraction before. Yep. I'm curious though, was there any announcements of them doing an Avengers campus in Florida? Nope. That seems odd that they wouldn't do one in Florida considering how popular that's going to be. Right. And especially when you did Star Wars, you. In both simultaneously. You did both. Yeah. You know, you weren't going to have one like, versus the other. Maybe they learned a lesson there. Maybe. Like, let's, let's open it in California and see how well, well it Well, and the other thing too is that in in Florida at Epcot, you're going to get the um, Guardians of the Galaxy ride, which yeah, isn't going to be... Not, that's not the same. I know. But I could see them I want a turning... robo Spider-Man flying around in the air. That would be actually really cool. But I could kind of see... And that's the thing is like, why is that in Epcot? It doesn't seem... But I could see them building a Stark Technologies and yeah, in Epcot. Turn Epcot <laughs> itself into like the Stark Expo. Right. Right there that is what you would have. would be, yeah. You could totally. The entire park could be themed that way. Because mm -hmm. so, it's not what Walt originally right. wanted it to be anyway. Right. So, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. you know, 10, 15 years from now, that's, you know. Interesting. Their plans. So. Well, at least a bug's land lives on in giant Christmas lights. Right. That's that's some. Sentimentality it's coming something. on there. <laughs> Better than nothing. Anyway, that's all we had for our uh, Disney Detective. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. 
Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. So from Space.com, an iconic Star Wars X-Wing fighter is going to find a new home at the Smithsonian. So the Force will be the, with the Smithsonian in 2022 as an esteemed museum in, Washing, uh, in Washington, D.C. rolls out their latest prize artifact next year in the form of an actual Star Wars X-Wing fighter. The iconic mosquito-like spaceship prop has been generously loaned to the Smithsonian by Lucasfilms Limited for an indefinite period. Um, so the uh, s- space history chair at the museum had said, despite taking place a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Star Wars introduced generations of fans here on Earth to outer space as a setting for advan- adventure and exploration. Um, all air and space milestones begin with inspiration and science fiction so often provided that spark. The iconic X-Wing displayed uh, amid our other spacecrafts celebrates the journey from imagination to achievement. So right now it's currently getting a proper shakedown and full comfort conservation effort at the restoration hangar in Virginia, um, which happens to also house some World War II warbirds as well. I think that's kind of funny that you have. Well, that's what's neat. If, you, if you're if you watching the <laughs> yeah, show, yeah. you can see it next. It looks like what's probably a B-17 bomber carcass, really, yeah. that's there. That's just pieces of it that they're assembling Yeah, and you well. have the, the X-Wing there, too. Um, you know, so basically they had said, you know, um, sometime late in the year, the T7 X Wing will go on public 70. Dis- 70, 70. I'm sorry. Come on, for those Star Wars people out there. I'm sorry. What did, he, what did Luke fly? <laughs> he didn't fly a 70. He did a 65. T65, right? Because I read the article. <laughs> eh. um, so it will go on display at the entrance to the Albert Einstein Planetarium at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum on the National Mall. Um, they said, we're thrilled to have the X-Wing as an exhibit, and it is a real screen-used vehicle from Rise of Skywalker from 2019. Um, and obviously, you know, this is kind of cool, and, and they talk about how that this isn't the first time that uh, Star Wars has been part of the museum. They actually had a collection of screen-used props and costumes um, that were in a 1997 exhibit called the uh, Star Wars, The Magic of Myth. Um, so, again, very cool that this is going to be coming. I'm sure once it's there, we'll be planning a trip down to Washington, D.C. to go and visit this. Um, okay, so so... For our viewing audience, the okay. sc- picture's up on the screen now. Okay. What is the single one most iconic thing that's missing from this uh, fighter right now? A droid? Yes. The droid is missing from the top. Well, Which droid are they going to put in there? I, I don't know. That'll be the question. That'll be interesting. Are you going to get a BB unit? Are you going to get an R2 unit? Mm. If you're going to be accurate to the <coughs> period, you know, it, it could be a BB unit. Right, right. So... So anyway, sorry, I was just geeking out. No, that's okay. So that's what I do uh, again, it is. Pl- they don't have a date yet. Obviously, as clearly, it, gets, it needs a little work. <laughs> it needs a little work. Um, but that was one of the other things too that they talked about in the article is that they wanted to make sure that the right things that needed to get fixed got fixed on it. Right. You know, if it was damage from traveling, they wanted to fix that. But if it was damage from a space battle. They didn't want to fix that, and that's what's funny because they talk about um, there's a there's a, a a mention in the article itself about when it came in, right? It looked like it had hangar rash. Mm-hmm. Hangar rash being when you're moving things around a hangar, right? And you get you get scuffed up, mm-hmm. and the 
the person from Lucasfilm said, oh, no, that's the artist's rendition of them actually having a, a used, lived-in looking fighter. So right. you know when this goes on display, it's not going to be like a pristine, pristine. beautiful oh, piece of, of, course of, not. of technology. It's actually going to look like it's a screen-used fighter from right. a battle. Right, Which is what's really cool that they're going for that level of authenticity. Yeah, yeah. I think that'll be very cool. You know, and, and for those of you, you know, that don't live in the area or do and, and you haven't been to the Air and Space Museum, it is a very cool uh, museum to go to in general. Uh, and it's nice because they've done Star Trek stuff. Obviously, like I mentioned, they, they've done Star Wars. So it's nice that they bring in, uh, you know. And, and for those that that are unfamiliar with it, there are two locations for the Air and Space mm -hmm. Museum. Right. Remember that. One's on the mall at the Smithsonian. Right. The other one's at the airport. So just be aware of that if you're going to go. Right. You don't want to miss Right. This the is airport. the one at the, this, this, where the, the X-Wing is going to be is the one on the mall. Right. So. Right. So, but go to the airport right. extension of it. Because that's that. where all the big ones are. Right. In fact, that's where one of the Transformers movies had mm -hmm. been filmed, where you see the SR-71 transform as well. Right, right. Which is kind of cool. Anyway, let's talk about who's going to replace Jack Sparrow. <laughs> so this article came up, and it's from InsideTheMagic.net. And at first I was like, oh, okay, so they're talking about somebody that's going to replace, you know, a Star Wars character that's replacing Jack Sparrow. And as you read the article... Nobody's really replacing Jack Sparrow. It's a completely. <laughs> it, it's basically they were saying Star Wars character Jack Sparrow. How can I draw a line between the two? And it's it's so not there. S slow news week is what we call it. So obviously Johnny Depp. We've talked about it before. He had a whole bunch of you know, issues in his private life. And basically Disney kind of said, eh, you're out. He, as... went the way, he went the way of uh, Cara Dune. Right. You know, and, but not only did he lose out on Jack Sparrow, but he also lost out on uh, being part of Fantastic Beasts as well. So basically they talk about how for the newest uh, Jack Sparrow movie, they're bringing in a, you know, completely different character. So it's not even, so they're not even trying to replace Johnny Depp, um, Jack Sparrow. They're bringing in a completely different. Just think of the budget they'll save on eyeshadow. <laughs> True. Um, you know, so uh, Margot Robbie is actually supposed to be the the helm of Pir Pirate 6. And then for Fantastic Beats... Beasts. Um, Beats is the musical version. Right. Uh, Mads uh, Michelson is Mickelson. Mickelson is supposed to be taking over the character um, that Johnny Depp played. But the article basically talks about how one of the characters from Star Wars is basically, <sighs> he's not replacing Johnny Depp, but he's quote unquote your, replacing that pirate that he's gonna fill aspect. that hole for that scoundrel. Right. That that's you need. really, you know, because it, it talks more about how um the character and you can say his name because I know I would Hondo Anaka. Thank you. That he he's never shown up in any live action shows. He's shown up in various different Animated. He was in uh, Clone Wars. He was in Rebels. Um, he hasn't shown up in the Bad Batch yet, but I suspect he probably will. Right. But that he's also part of Galaxy's Edge. He plays a, a part in in the rides at Galaxy's Edge. He's, he's now storyline based. He's a part owner of the Millennium Falcon. Right. So the idea is that he's kind of the space pirate. He's the space equivalent, I guess, of what... Jack Sparrow would be, and now that you have all of these plethora of Star Wars shows, live action shows coming, don't be surprised if you see him pop up in something in a live action. Well, and the beauty of it is, is his audio animatronic is so realistic, they can just <laughs> they bring that out really. on stage and use that. Yeah, 
really they could. So the article was really long, and it was one of those, you kind of read through it and go, so what Star Wars characters are replacing yeah, oh it's like no! Not no. even the voice actor is going to be in the Johnny Depp movies. Like, right. There's no, literally, no connection whatsoever. It's just filling that role of that scoundrel pirate. Right. Since Johnny Depp's not doing it anymore. Hey. Hondo Anaka. Right. Will be if that you're killer. missing pirates, come on over to this guy. Right. That was really what it. This it was in reading the <laughs> article. It was a desperate <laughs> attempt to draw a parallel between. Right, the and two. it was, and it wasn't like it was short. It was a short article. It right. was a, so. Hey, I give credit to the person what, who what wrote this it, was, and this was <laughs> this was a desperate attempt to get Star Wars fans to like Pirates of the Caribbean if you didn't already like it. I guess, yeah. Yeah. So that was that was pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. And that was all we had for our tales from the edge of the galaxy this week. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back with uh, what are we doing now? Oh, entertainment, entertainment news. news. That's what we do here. Right. right. We'll be right back. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So this was actually kind of a funny story. This came from CBR.com, and it says that the boys had issued an appropriately harsh warning to those begging for season three. So Amazon Prime's videos, um, the, the boys has issued a warning to fans asking for a season three release date. Um, so from their official Twitter account, they had said, every time you ask when season three is coming out, uh, the release date gets pushed back one more day. See you in 2033. <laughs> so while details, obviously, regarding the third season of the original series are slowly being released, an official release date, obvious, uh, release date hasn't been announced yet. And this isn't the first time that they teased fans about the uh, season three date. Uh, in May, the account tweeted a post from the MTV Mu uh, Movie and TV Awards account where fans submitted questions uh, for series star Jack Quaid to answer during the awards pop-up pre-show. And basically it was, you know, when season three? So everybody's obviously itching for it. Um, but season three began filming in late January 2021 after production delays, obviously, due to the pandemic. Um, so the showrunner basically had, you know, again said um, that no date had been set, but teased that it would be a mind-blowing first episode, calling it both insane and special. Um, the boys' Twitter account also had responded saying that the editing room uh, floor is fully covered in gore already and we're only on working on episode one. <laughs> so I can only imagine what's going to be blown up and who's not going to survive. Well, you, you still have a superhero out there. You know, blowing people's heads up. So that's right. You're going to see a lot of that. Right. So it'll and be babies with freaking laser beams. Babies with laser beams. So obviously, the majority of the cast that didn't get blown up uh, at the end of season two will be back. Which isn't that many. Which I'll isn't that many. That right but now. there's a, there's a bunch, and then obviously they have some new people uh, that are are joining the cast as well. So so I will say. As much as I'm looking forward to a season three, Invincible is doing a very good job of tidying me yes. over until then. Yes, that's a very good gap filler. So for those of you who are fans of the boys who kind of need to f 
fill that Jones for some superhero massacres. <laughs> right. Uh, That's a good Invincible, way to put it. <laughs> also on Amazon Prime Video, is mm-hmm. a good filler for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, definitely waiting to see this one come back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What else do we have? Poor Harrison Ford. <laughs> So from Variety.com, it seems that Harrison Ford got injured while filming Indiana Jones 5. Uh, so Did the Millennium Falcon door <laughs> crash on him again? No. It seems he sustained a shoulder injury on the set of Indiana Jones 5, r- requiring the actor to take a hiatus from filming while treatment is evaluated. In the meantime, the director, James Mangold, will continue to shoot without Ford. Um a Disney What's bringing in Chevys? <laughs> That's funny. A Disney spokesperson had said, in the course of rehearsing a fight scene, Harrison Ford sustained an injury involving his shoulder. Production will continue while the appropriate course of treatment is evaluated and the filming schedule will be config- configured <clears throat> excuse me, as needed in the coming weeks. Uh, the extent of his injury is unknown, um, though it's hardly the first time that he's hurt himself during the making of a movie. In the past, he suffered a serious back injury on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and then he had the leg trauma when he was filming The Force Awakens when the Millennium Falcon door Well, he had that major injury when he did Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of Crystal Skull. That injury was ego because the movie was so bad. (laughs) I was like, wait a second, (laughs) what? Oh, and who else is in this movie? Mads. Mads Mikkelsen. Mikkelsen. <laughs> right, because like he and The Rock are in the competition for who can be in the most movies in a year, I think. True, true. <laughs> and you figure what? He's done Star Wars. He's, you know, he's he's going to do um, the Fantastic Beast. Now he's Indiana Jones. He's he did kinda, Marvel. He did Marvel, so he's kind of, you know. Right, he's everywhere. Plotting around. So, um The production actually began earlier this month in the UK. The plot details for the sequel haven't been announced yet, uh, though the 78-year-old Ford is reprising his iconic role. Um, Indiana Jones had been delayed several times and is currently scheduled to uh, debut in theaters on July 29th of 2022. And it's actually almost 15 years after the most recent Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls. I didn't even think it was that long ago. Like, it, Yeah, it's so bad. It feels like it was just yesterday. <laughs> it feels like it, I knew you were going to say that. And four decades <coughs> after the initial installment of the 1981 Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, Steven Spielberg, who directed the first four films of the franchise, was initially set to direct uh, Indiana Jones 5, but he actually passed it off to Mangold. uh, He's like, oh man, he sent me and I'm out of here. I'm not (laughs) not directing this train wreck. (laughs) Right. So Spielberg is still expected to remain hands-on as a producer, while George Lucas, who had created Indiana Jones with Spielberg, is too busy trying to weasel his way back back into into Star Star Wars, Wars. hasn't officially been involved with Indy 5 yet. At 78 (laughs) years old, this man needs a stunt double to go to the bathroom. How's he getting hurt in a rehearsing a fight scene? Like, he shouldn't be doing anything that requires him to exert himself at this point in time. Right. Well, and the other thing, too, which I know I had mentioned it to you before, um, was when you figure out the the time frame uh, of everything, um, the the whole paradox uh, thing. So when Indiana Jones, you know, first started, it was, you know, what year was it or whatever. Now we're 40 years later. So it's technically like the early 70s, it right. should be. So Indiana Jones has gone to Woodstock. Right. So Indiana Jones should possibly maybe be able to go to the movies and see Star Wars A New Hope. Right. Which would kind of be funny if it's they... It's Indiana Jones, get off my lawn, you damn kids. <laughs> Indiana Jones at the at the nursing home. Indiana <laughs> Jones and the Revenge of the Walker. <laughs> like, up. Like, come on, man. Like... <sighs> Well, and that was the thing, because after Crystal Skull, it was kind of like, I'm passing it on to the next generation. Right. And he didn't, because he picked up the hat and walked out of the church. Right. Had he let the kid pick up the hat, Mm -hmm. you'd have wacko Shia LaBeouf running around. (laughs) Or you could have just put somebody else in it. Yeah, you could have recast it. It's been 15 years, you know, you could have... 
could have been. You could have recast someone slightly more sane in the part. <laughs> I know who you could have could have had. Who's that? Your favorite, your favorite actor. I want to be a pilot. Oh God, no! I thought you were going to say <laughs> Nicolas Cage. No. I wasn't going to do that. All right. <clears throat> I think that's it. I don't want to beat the dead horse. No, the horse is, it's fine. You know, I think they should be okay. You know, he's, yeah. he's going to survive as long as he doesn't get in a plane. He should be fine because <laughs> he doesn't fly very yeah, well. He either. Maybe he doesn't fly anymore. So, um, yeah. anyway, 78 years old, you, you shouldn't be flying or fighting. <sighs> yeah. That's yeah. just golden rule there. Right. Anyway, that's all we have for our entertainment news. We'll be mm-hmm. right back with our insightful picks. Mm-hmm. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is a show that a friend of mine had uh, recommended to me that's on Netflix. It is called Stiesel. Um, and it is about an ultra-Orthodox family who live in one of the areas of Jerusalem that is obviously, um, not obviously, but it, where the ultra-Orthodox live and basically talks about uh, it goes through their love and loss and their basic dealings with daily life and how they they surround it. What's interesting about it is it's very much, <laughs> you know, as I'm watching this, it's very much the the Jewish equivalent of this is us in a lot of ways. Um, you have the the matriarch of the family uh, who with in the past year has lost his wife. So he's still dealing with that. Then you have all of their, the patriarch, the patriarch, I'm sorry, because the matriarch passed away. Um, and he's dealing with that and how to kind of move on with his life. Then all of his children kind of have their own issues as well. The one son had a promising singing career, but was never, was pushed to be a scholar and not a musician. And you kind of see that his dreams didn't come true. And then you have the one daughter who has marital problems and, and problems with her, her children and is trying to kind of move on. And then the one son who's the youngest of the family gets engaged like multiple times. And it isn't until like the third time that it it finally kind of works out. Um, So it's an interesting um, dynamic, you know, again, it, the the themes are, are very much your normal family drama type thing. You know, what's interesting is they do some flashbacks, kind of like This Is Us does, but they also do a lot of ghosts kind of showing up, you know, people kind of having dreams about various relatives that are no longer there and kind of trying to get their opinion of of things. Um, So the series actually premiered in 2013. Uh, The first two seasons kind of uh, were filmed back to back and they were uh, 12 episodes each. But then the third season actually didn't start um, until seven years later. So uh, I just started season three, and what's interesting is it's a seven-year time gap, uh, time jump, and they still have all of the same actors. So, you know, from season two where somebody was 13 years old, now they're an adult, you know, what, some of the, the grandkids and, and things like that. And um, so you get to kind of find out what happened in that four-year, uh, that uh, that seven-year time frame um, from various articles there is supposed to be a season four uh the biggest problem is trying to uh, write it you know because the reason why they had that gap was they kind of had writer's block the the writers kind of went and wrote some other things and then kind of came back to it the other thing too is at the time when this was done all of the actors were kind of unknowns like you know they kind of knew you know if you were from israel you knew the actors but if you were from any place else you didn't really know them now they have much more of a notoriety so now of course the budget's going to be higher and it's going to be harder to film and things like that so it might be a little while until the next one but there is supposed to be a season four so it you know the other thing too is it's all in hebrew or yiddish so (laughs) um so there's it's subtitles 
for everything. So if you're not used to watching subtitles, it takes a little getting used to. It's definitely one of those things you can't look away when there's an argument going on because you're going to miss half of the the fight. Um, But very well done. And like I said, if you like This Is Us, you know, if you're not Jewish, there might be some things that you might not really understand. But for the most part, it's not over the top with, you know, certain things where you just kind of, you know, it's just kind of part of the story, but you don't need to know certain things to to follow it. Okay, good pick. Thank you. I'll read the book when it comes out. <laughs> so my pick this week, we're going back to my roots of uh, documentaries. And my pick this week is the Jupiter Enigma on Amazon Prime. What can the red, uh, the giant planet, Jupiter, tell us about the birth of our solar system five billion years ago? Drawing on new findings from NASA's Juno mission, scientists are peering into Jupiter's stormy heart to reveal the very origins of our solar system, a chaotic early time when smaller planets were flung around space or sent into shattering collisions, and the fate of planet Earth Hung in the balance. Sounds exciting, doesn't it, when they write it like that? Mm Mm-hmm, sure does. The Juno probe is the most recent visitor to Jupiter. Orbiting and examining Jupiter with a variety of instruments, it provides a new understanding of the storms on the planet and Jupiter's interior. New simulations examine the impact of Jupiter on the evolution of the solar system. So using a mix of computer-generated graphics, artistic renderings, and actual high-quality footage from Juno, the Jupiter Enigma explores the solar system's largest planet in a detail never seen before. From its influence on the creation of our solar system, to the detail and incredible scientific potential of its dozens of moons, there's a wealth of knowledge about the planet revealed in the show. Did you know Jupiter is the fastest spinning planet in the solar system? I did not. Did you know that Jupiter's clouds are only five kilometers thick? Nope. Despite the size of the planet. Did you know Jupiter has its own system of rings similar to Saturn? Yes. Okay, well, maybe you learn it somewhere else. (laughs) Uh, I didn't realize this was a quiz. (laughs) Did you know? (laughs) These, where were you on the night of that? Sorry. (laughs) Uh, These and many other interesting scientific facts are explored in great detail in the show, The Jupiter Enigma, available streaming on Amazon Prime. And we'll be right back with our afterthoughts. I forgot what we called them. It was an afterthought to me. Go with our afterthoughts. So just like we had mentioned last week, now it seems there's a couple more conventions that are popping up. Um, So we had mentioned Monster Mania, uh, which you can find all the information on monstermania.net. So you have Monster Mania 46, which will be uh, in August in Cherry Hill. Then Monster Mania 47, which will be in September in Hunt Valley, Maryland. And then Monster Mania 48, which will be in October at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks, which is the first time ever that they are going to be in that location. So that was kind of exciting news. Um, then we have RetroCon. RetroCon. <laughs> which is um, also going to be at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. And that will be uh, the end of September, the 26th and the 27th. Uh, so that's a nice, uh, smaller kind of uh, event. It's usually just held in in one of the uh, the areas of um, one of the four <laughs> wings that they right. Have. One of the and they usually have a couple of guests, um, but it's mostly retro toys and it's the only show I've ever been to where the GI Joe costuming club shows up. Yeah. Which is really cool. Yeah, that that was cool. Uh, Then, big news, Wizard World Philadelphia. Wizard. Um, So they had, so tickets, I believe they're on sale. Um, But it was kind of weird, the the site that they had available. Plus, the the photo ops are already sold out. Um, 
or maybe they just haven't opened them up yet. Because it, it was originally <coughs> scheduled for January. For January, it was rescheduled. That was a reschedule <coughs> of the last one. Right, because it was supposed to be in 2020. Right. They rescheduled it to January of 2021. Obviously, that came and went. So now it's going to be November uh, 12th, 13th, and 14th. And I guess w- for whatever reason, it's normally in downtown Philadelphia at the convention center. This time, for the first time ever, this is going to be at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks. That convention center is just exploding now. I think, Real, I think people like have every just, <laughs> pa- if nothing else, the pandemic has caused people to discover the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. Yeah, you know, like, and as we mentioned, you know, before, for us, it's a little bit further out of the way than going to Philly, but... But I'd rather do that than to deal with the city. You don't have to deal with the city. You don't have to deal with trying to find parking because that's always uh, a pain. And a fortune. And a fortune, you know. So you drive a little bit further, but you got free parking and it's, you know, very open and, and you know, we've never been there at night, but very well lit. Uh, so, and just... It's a convention center that we've enjoyed going to for various different events. Um, so, okay, we'll just keep going there. Um, and then, as we had mentioned, uh, that in December uh, is the Ocean City Comic Con. This was one that we haven't been able to go to before, but now we are planning on doing this. Uh, the Ocean City Comic Con is just a one-day event on December 11th, where all the other ones are two or, or three-day um, events. So it's neat because if you look at the lineup, and and we'll post it in the show notes. If you look mm-hmm. at the lineup, there's literally a convention pretty much every month from here until December. Right. There's nothing until August. Right. So you have August. You have Cherry Hill. Then September you have the RetroCon and Monster Mania, um, which are actually the same weekend. Then you have the other Monster Mania in October. Then you have Wizard World in November, and then you have uh, Ocean City in December. Right. So, and I'm sure that you know, as as restrictions are lifted mm-hmm. and people start scheduling stuff, mm-hmm. you know, one of the other ones that we do like to, to do is the classic toy show down in uh, the Nurse Shrine down right, in Delaware. Right. They had to cancel those. Oh, you know what other one is supposed to be this summer? Um, the Fuge one. The, the Fuge. Fuge. Um, which one was that? Zolocon. 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 I, See, be- I, I gotta come up with a good one for Ocean City. It doesn't. doesn't no, really doesn't. Work. Yeah, I believe Zolocon is supposed to be like July or something. Well, there you go. So that's probably your July one. That's so our we'll July. we'll make sure to put that one in next week. So so we'll kind of keep this up just to to remind everybody of what's coming and if we see, you know, anything else that that pops up, we'll we'll obviously mention it, but he's going to do a quick Google search of Zolocon we to have see the technology. <laughs> do we cuz I'll just keep Zolocon talking and 21 is scheduled for July 18th. See? Told you. Yep, there you go. Told so you. We got to get that into the notes for next yeah, week. Yeah. So that's always a good one. We love that one. Yeah. That's a great venue. To well, go and to. that's really that's Which by the way, just a little spoilers. That venue is going to show up on our new Insights in the History podcast mm-hmm. in a in a special episode too. Right. So that happens to be one of those locations where the venue is as much a part of Absolutely. the atmosphere as just you know, the largest going. centrifuge in the world. Yeah, and you get to see it. You get to walk around it, and you're like, "Free ride!" Oh my God, <laughs> no, that would. Well, it doesn't go anywhere, but <laughs> you, know, you can get in it. Well, no, you can't. Yeah, they were letting people in the last time. Really? Well, I don't know if they were letting people, but people were getting in it last uh, time. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, people were getting in and getting pictures. Yeah. Well. So anyway. Yeah. Anyway. That's all we had for this week. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to do plugs at the end because we're we we inundated people with sure. stuff. So um, that's it for this week, and um, thanks for watching. (laughs) Find all of our links, because we're not going to give everything out, but find all of the links to everything at our website, www.insightsintothings.com. There you go. The consummate professional. Thank you. I try. That's it. 
We're done. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. 